Once again today we greet you in the precious and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the auditorium of Northside Baptist Church today. We have several visitors. We're delighted to have you. May God bless you. You're always welcome. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium here in Athens, Georgia. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. I have a good suggestion to make for you in the radio listening audience. If you have a tape recorder, why don't you just tape the entire hour and then you'll have it on tape to maybe let others hear it or take it to people in the hospital and whatnot and just hook that tape recorder up and go right ahead and tape the entire hour out there in the radio listening audience. You do that every Sunday. You can accumulate a number of uh, good messages and singing and music on your tape and you have it there in your home. Children, the babies in the auditorium. You know, I, I believe in keeping the babies in the auditorium if possible because they need to learn to grow up in the auditorium and not stuck off way somewhere in a different part of the church building where they can't hear the preacher singing or whatnot. And we appreciate our little ones in the auditorium and our mothers, they cooperate with us the best they can in keeping them quiet. And we appreciate that if they get too noisy and disturb those around them. We have a little nursery in the back there where they can take them and hear the preacher and see just as well. But you welcome to keep your babies in the auditorium. I want you to do that. That's, that's my request, if at all possible. Now, some ministers are very critical about it and won't allow children in the auditorium. I'm not that way. I want them in the auditorium, in the mother's lap, so the dad's lap, or sitting beside of them as much as possible. I believe that's helpful. And when the time ever comes that I can't drown out a young un, I'll quit preaching. I want you to know that. But if they disturb those around you, around then of course you have uh, you're obligated to take them to the nursery and sit with them, or take them on the outside and apply the board education to the seat of knowledge and bring them back in, or whatever it takes. But sometimes you have to do that. A little spanking goes a long way sometimes. I got several in my lifetime, and I appreciate them. Now, Brother Tony didn't know I was going to do this, but Tony teaches piano, he teaches guitar, he teaches voice, and I guess he could teach organ, I don't know, I guess so. Tell you how to blow a horn, blow a harp, blow your nose, and whatnot. And uh, Tony would be available if you'd like to uh, have him as your music teacher. And I'm going to give you his phone number, and you can call him. You might be due him down on the price. I don't know, and you might not. But anyway, that'd be you and him about that. I don't know what he'd charge you. Uh, but his phone number is 677-2827. That's 677-2827. And or you can contact him through my phone number here, 543-4586, the church phone number, the, the pastoral phone number. Now, I don't want to guarantee you he'll have you perfect in 12 months or not. That'd be between you and him. But uh, Tony could help you, I'm sure. Take your Bible today and turn, would you please, Luke chapter 15. The message today, the song that Jeff sang is in keeping uh, with my message, I requested that song. I love it. It's very beautiful. And you have the original Schofield Reference Bible. It's page 1097. Page 1097. I have several original Schofield Reference Bibles in my study. I can save you a little money on them. As I said before, I'm not in the Bible selling business, but I accumulate some along. I might save our members and friends a few dollars if we decide to buy one. But I have them available. And if you'd like to write in and get a list of my cassette tape, you can do so. Uh, we'll have this tape today will be tape number 288. Tape number 288. I'm speaking on the subject from the house to the hog pen and back. From the house to the hog pen and back. That's my subject today. And you can call for the tape by title or by number. Or if you'd like to have a list, we'll send you a list of our cassette tape. Now, Luke chapter 15. Then drew near unto him all the public and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you have a hundred sheep, 
If you lose one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, does not light a camel, sweep the house, and seek diligence that she find it. And when she's found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the piece which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, that is joy in the presence of the angel of God over one sinner that repenteth. And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the young of them said to his father, Give me the portion of good that falleth to me, and divide unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance without his living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, he began to be in want. And when he joined himself to the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have fain filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will rise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and no more words to be called thy son. Make me one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. Now no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said unto the servant, Bring forth the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring hither the fatted calf and kid and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now if you notice it mentioned here the father's house also mentioned uh, the field where the hogs were kept. So this boy left the house. He left his father's house, went to the hog pen, came back again. That's the theme I'm using today. And many of you writing in Father Tape, if you do write in, my post office box is 501 Athens, Georgia, 30603. That's Virgil Edwards, post office box 501 Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. Now, before I get into the message and getting back to our little children, many times just before a song, you hear a child cry out. And the reason that child cries out, grandmother's got it spoiled, a mother's got it spoiled to the extent when they give it to somebody else to come and sing or come to the instrument, then the baby cries. So you'll have to blame that on the grandmothers as a general rule and sometimes on the mothers, see. Uh, they spoil those kids and when nobody else can't hold them without them crying. So uh, that's why right after, uh, just before we start a song, you hear a baby cry sometimes so you understand why. So you get on their mothers and grandmothers about that and maybe then train them, let somebody else hold them, let their dad or grandpa or somebody hold them or take them back or do something. And that helps that situation. So we appreciate them, appreciate the mothers, grandmothers, dads and grandfathers, and especially our little babies. We appreciate them. Now here we find in this parable, we have one parable in three parts. You have here the Trinity at work. You have the shepherd's toil. You have the Spirit's search, and you have the Father's heart of welcome. You have that pertaining to the lost sheep, the lost corn, and the lost son. You have the threefold condition of a sinner here in this scripture. Now, this scripture, we call him the prodigal son. Many times we use him as a picture of a backslider, but really Jesus is illustrating the condition of a lost man here, not a backslider. Now, the sheep was lost, unable to find his way. That's a picture of a lost sinner. Uh, the corn was lost, which betrays the solemn fact that the sinner is spiritually dead. That corn is dead, no doubt. The sons in a faraway country alienated from God, away with at heart, a picture of that sinner away from God. Now I want you to notice, first of all, in verse 13, the son leaves home. He's given his potion, he has a soul, he has natural talent and ability, and he's given his potion and he leaves home. Now that's a picture of a sinner that has a soul, he has a talent, he has natural ability, and then he, he doesn't use it for God because he's not right with God. And he goes out and many times he uses that talent in the world 
and burns up his talent out there in the world, use it for the devil, and he'll be sorry when he comes to the end of life's journey. The Bible said he begins to be in want in a far away country. Now this young man left home, he left the house, he went away, he had all of his talent, his ability, natural of course I'm speaking, and then he had a soul. That's a picture of every sinner. Multitudes are doing that today. And then he went to the faraway country and the world had nothing to offer the soul but a famine. That's all this world has to offer that sinner is a famine. Nothing spiritual. Everything that you receive from this world you can put in that category as a famine in regard to spiritual things. Number two, when he begins to be in one in verse 14, he seeks to join something. Now you'd be surprised at sinners today when they get under conviction, get disturbed, they want to join something. Now, beloved, joining something is not going to save any man. Joining the church, joining some larger club or uh, some organization is not going to save any man. The only thing that's going to save a man is joining Jesus. When he gets saved, God joins him to Jesus Christ, and then he's a child of God. Now then, the church membership comes second. You ought to join the church. You should be baptized after you join to Jesus. And uh, that's what, what I belong to. I belong to God first. I belong to my wife. I belong to the church. That's all the organizations I can't think about be, uh, belonging to. But a lot of people will join worldly clubs and organizations and seeking some kind of religious feeling about it or attitude. But that will not get them to heaven. That will not save them. The only way to get to heaven is through faith in Jesus Christ plus nothing, minus nothing. And he begins to be in one and he joins something. You know what he joins? He joined the swine's club. The Bible says in verse 15, he was sent and joined to a citizen of that country. And there he joined the swine's club in verse 15. He sent him into the field to feed swine. Now, joining the swine's club didn't help this man. He was out there eating the husk that the swine didn't eat, so that didn't help him. Now, you can join all the clubs and lodges and fraternities as you want to. That's not going to feed your soul. It's not going to help you spiritually if you're not saved. You must remember that. Now, a swine in the Bible is a type of a so-called apostatized Christianity or a dead religion. When you find the swine mentioned, remember he's a type of so-called apostatized uh, so-called Christianity or dead religion. And 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, for after they had escaped the pollution of the world through knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, they again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they had known, turned from the holy commandment, delivered unto them. But it's happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to a wallowing in the mire. Now that's a picture of a man that unites with some form of religion or organization. And then he just turns right back into that apostatized religion and still comes short of real true salvation. Now I don't like to mention this, but it's a true fact. You have seen it. You've seen a dog vomit and then go right back and, and eat it up again. You've seen a hog maybe be clean, turn that hog loose. He finds a mud hole. Then he jumps in that mud hole. All, all you get out of that hog is a good sense of, uh, of uh, good old, uh, being satisfied. He's satisfied in a mud hole. He likes that mud. You can take that hog. You can paint his toenails, pluck out his eyebrows, leave about two in the heel. Put some perfume on him, put a uh, ribbon around his neck, put all the tags you want to, tie a ribbon to his tail. You turn that hog loose and he'll go as straight to a mud hole as a martin to his goat if he can find one. And then he buries himself in that mud hole. He will blink those eyes that you have all fixed up for him. Ribbon, eyes, perfume and all, ringing his nose and his ears. And in that mud hole he goes. That doesn't help that hog. Why? Because he's a hog. Now you can dress up all these religions that you hear about, but it's not going to save you. you they look mighty pretty, and uh, you say, oh, that's enticing. I like that. That's wonderful. That's not going to save you. Salvation is in Jesus Christ. 
Salvation is in a person. Religious works will not save any man. All false religions today are based on human works, but salvation on humanism and on works and human efforts. A person can only be saved by the sovereign grace of God Almighty. It's God's grace that saves that person, plus nothing, minus nothing. Nothing he could do to save himself. Nothing he could do to help himself be saved. It's all of God. When he comes, takes himself before God as a sinner, presents himself a lost person, and repents, believes on Christ, God saves him right then. That's all by the grace of God. Now notice he came to himself in verse 17. Now after he came to himself, he feels the mighty famine. Knows in a faraway country, no man could give to him. He comes to himself, he thinks about the bread in the father's house. Now this man would not have turned back and went back to the house, or went back home had he not thought about the bread in his father's house. He was hungry, he was tired eating hog feed. And he was hungry, he wanted to go back. You'll never get that sinner saved until you get him lost. When you get him lost and show him he's lost on the road to hell, feeding on the hustle, swine death to eat, and tell him about the good things of God, you have some hope of getting him saved, but you won't until you do. You got to get many of these religious sinners lost before you can get them saved. They don't know they're lost. They think they're all right. They have joined some church, maybe been sprinkled, Christian, even a Christian, even baptized, reformed, educated, or whatnot, and don't know a bit more about God than a cow knows when Sunday comes. Beloved, you listen to me. You got to get a person lost. Give him the gospel. Let him know he's going to hell. Let him know Jesus Christ will save him. Let him know he needs a savior. Let him know how to be saved and you have some hope of getting him saved as long as he can wrap up in religious rags and go on his merry way join everything that comes along then he's lost and on the road to hell that's exactly what the devil wants make him feel good in his religious deeds and good works now this man came to himself if a sinner ever comes to himself you have some hope of getting him saved number four he did something about it in verse 20. He arose and came to his father. He didn't sit there and blink his eyes at those hogs and listen at their grunts. He said, I'm a fool. I'm going back to the house. I'm, I came from the house, the hog pen. I'm going from the hog pen back to the house. I, I'm a fool sitting down here in this field feeding these stinking hogs. I'm going to do something about it. And he arose and came to his father. In his mind, he still wanted to be a hired servant because he said, when I get back home, I'm going to tell my father thus and thus. I just want to be a hired servant. God don't save you on your condition and your ground. You may come down and say, well, I want to be a good church member. but I want to do thus and thus. And, and in that way, I can get it. No, no. God doesn't save you on your terminology of ground. God saves you on his ground. When God saves you, then you can do these good things for the Lord. But don't come down with some idea in your mind that you're going to promise this and promise that and promise to pay this, promise to pay that, promise to dress up, do better, and hoping that'll save you. No, no. The old song said, come just as you are. Without one plea, it was thy blood that is shed for me. And when you come just like you are and God saves you, then if you want to straighten out any mess you've made in the past, feel free to do so. He wanted to be one of the hired servants. A hired servant works. Now, people today, if they can do a little work, do something from a humanistic viewpoint to get to heaven, they'll do it. You could tell a man, say, man, listen, if you walk on your knees and hit the highway out there, you'd be safe. Man, he'll start walking. He wants to do something to be saved. But you could tell that same man, all you need to do is take your place before God, realize you're a lost sinner, say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Save me by your marvelous grace. He don't want to do that. That's too simple. He wants to do something. He wants to join something. He wants to give up. So he wants to quit something. He wants to do better. What he needs to do is come to God, and after God saves him, let him do better. Let him straighten up any mess he's made if he wants to. Let him go back and make restitution if he wants to. But he's got to come to God just like he is. Somebody said, well, I'd get saved, but i got to go out and straighten up a few things. That don't mean a thing in the world. The devil tells you to do that, and you'll die and go to hell. I expect to straighten up something back there. You come to God first, and God will help you straighten them up. Now we come to thought number five, and that is the hearty welcome he received. Now, this father did five things. There's five, five in the Bible's number of grace, and this father's the type of God. He did five things. Notice what he did. Number one. While he was a great way off, the father saw him. Verse 20, God sees every sinner today in the world. 
Nothing hid from God. God sees you if you're lost. If you're out there in the radio listening audience and just got over drunk last night, you know why it's been the fuss. You're talking about separating. God sees you. You heard everything you said. He knows all about you. Now, God sees you. He certainly does. Now, what is a great way off? The father saw him. And in verse 20, the father had compassion on him. Now, whether you realize or not, God has compassion on sinners. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loves us, even when we're dead in sin, has quickened us together with Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his best. Now, remember, the Father had compassion on this boy coming home. And God has compassion on sinners. Number four, we find that he ran to meet him. Now, the father ran. This is the only place in the Bible you can ever find where God ever got in a hurry. And this is only in a type. And this is when he's running to meet that sinner, that lost boy. He's running to meet him. And he got into a hurry. If God ever moves in a hurry, it'll be whenever he's going to meet a sinner to get saved. God's got forever to do what he wants to do in. Uh, time means nothing to God. He's got forever. He's always been, always will be. And uh, just remember that. And so th when God ever moves hurriedly, it'll be when that sinner wants to be saved. And then he fell on his neck and embraced him. That's a picture of the loving God taking that sinner in his arms and bosom and pardoning that sinner from his sin and, and taking him in. That's what God does for sinners. That's what he did for me many years ago. And then the father kissed him. That's a picture of love. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believed in him shall not perish, but have everlasting lives. The Bible says, kiss the son, lest he be angry. Here we find some kissing going on. This is a picture of God kissing that sinner, kissing away his sins, letting him know he loves him, and letting him know that he'll save him. God doesn't love his sins, but he loved the poor lost sinner's soul. No doubt about that. Now notice the response that we get. I showed you five things that the father did. He, he, uh, he saw him a great way off. He had compassion on him. He ran to meet him. He fell on his neck and he kissed him. Those five things, the number of grace. And then number six, notice this boy's response. He says in verse 21, The son said unto his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called your son. That's a good position for a man to get in. I have sinned against heaven. Every man that's listening to me today has sinned against heaven. And he said, I, I've, I've sinned in your sight. I'm no more worthy to be called your son. And no sinner is worthy to be called a child of God. And he's not a child of God until he gets saved. He's not worthy to be called a child of God. Now, when he gets saved, he is a child of God. The Bible says, to his men receive him, them gave you power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. And so whenever you get saved, you're a child of God, and none until then. You're God's by creation, but not God's by new birth. And being God's by creation doesn't mean you go to heaven. You won't unless you become God's by a spiritual birth, the new birth, being saved, placed in the family of God. And so he said, um, I've sinned and so forth. He felt very sinful. But you know, he changed his mind. He's, he didn't say anything about a hide servant. Now, when he left the hog pen, he said, I'm going home. I'm going to that house I left. I'm going to tell my father to just make me an old hide servant around the house. Just, just let me start working around the farm there. Just make me a hide servant. But you know, when the father met him, he didn't mention being a hide servant. Did you know there's a lot of sinners that's come forward and they said, I'm going to tell God this when I get down to the altar and I'm going to tell God that and, and then I'm going to tell the people this and I'm going to give my testimony and so forth. And when they get down to the altar, they're so shaken up and in repentance and maybe weeping, they forget all about that little spill they had all conjured up in their minds. Been a lot of people come down and got saved and said, now I know the preacher wants me to say a word and I'm going to figure out now what to say. And when they got out of the altar and got saved, uh, many, many of them couldn't say a word. Many of them didn't want to say it and say, they stood there and weep and laughed or cried or whatnot. And they forget about that little spill. You don't have to bring any little speech to God when you get saved. You don't need it. God don't care anything about it. He knows about it anyway. Just come to God and just throw yourself by faith on God as a sinner and say, Lord, I should have been in hell a long time ago and you've been so good to me. You kept me out of hell. I want to get saved. I will go to heaven when I die. And when God gets through with you, your little speech will be gone. 
You might get up and tell people glad you got saved, but you're not really not going to give the speech you had made up when you came down. If you really got saved when you came forward. And so he said nothing about being a hired servant. And then number seven, I want you to notice what this man bestowed on this boy. He bestowed something on this boy I want you to see. Number one, he put a robe on him. Verse 22, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And the father placed that robe on him. That robe is a type of the divine righteousness of God. That God imputes unto that sinner the moment he gets saved. See, when you get saved, God clothes you in his imputed righteousness. That's God's robe for you. This father took that robe and didn't say, Now, you fellas come here and hold the boy and slip it on him. He knew he put it on himself. When God saves you, nobody puts that divine imputed righteousness on you. God does that. God puts the robe on you when you get saved. God puts that robe on you, which is the divine imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. So he placed it on him. It was done for him. You know, God placed the robe on Adam and Eve. Or uh, rather, when he drove out of the garden and God took the skins of animals and put them on Adam and Eve. And the Bible speaks about the robe of righteousness and self-righteousness and so forth all through the Bible. See, when a sinner comes to God, God wraps you up in his beautiful robe of imputed righteousness. And you're a different person from there on in. Number two, he put a ring on his finger. A ring in the Bible is a symbol of ownership. It's a seal. It's a, it speaks of authority. It speaks of position. And he put a ring on in verse 22. This speaks of the seal of the Holy Spirit. When you get saved, God seals you with the Holy Spirit. That ring is symbolic of that seal. You're sealed. Now, when you get married, you put a ring on the, your bride and she puts the ring on the bridegroom. And what does that mean? That means the woman that wears that ring belongs to you. That's a seal. She's yours. And that means that man that wears that ring belongs to you. He's your property. He's yours. And that ring is a seal, a sign that he belongs to you. And so he put a ring on his finger, meaning that he belongs now to the father there in the father's house as a symbol of never ending love. In these rings, you don't find any end. I have one here and I have no end. That's a symbol of never ending love. God never ceases to love you. And of course, it speaks of ownership. It speaks of high honor esteem. In Genesis chapter 41 and verse 42, we find down in Egypt that Pharaoh said, I'm going to put Joseph in charge of everything in Egypt. Stick a ring on his finger. That means he has my ring, my approval, and what he says goes. You people do exactly what he tells you to do. He's in the place of authority. He's going to ride in the second carriage behind me. He's the man that's going to have charge of things around you. He's got that ring on his finger. And when God saves you, he puts that ring on your fingers where he seals you by the Holy Spirit. God says, you are my property. You belong to me from here on in. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. You belong to God. Not only that, but he puts shoes on his feet. Now, shoes speaks of service. Now, in those days, uh, uh, servants went barefooted. Only sons wore shoes. If a man had a farm, he put shoes on his sons. His servants went barefooted. They didn't have any shoes. Now, this boy came home as a servant, barefooted, no shoes on. But the father said, now nah, he's my son. He's back in my house. And I, I want him to know he's my son and put them shoes on his feet. He's not one of the hired servants around here. And God discharged you with the preservation of gospel of peace. And God put your shoes on when you got saved, those gospel shoes. God put them on your feet. And God wants you to wear them because you belong to him. Now, shoes speaks of provision for daily walk. In Exodus chapter 12 and verse 11, and thus shall you eat it with shoes on your feet. You mean you get busy for God. You wouldn't necessarily wear shoes. You're going to sit around your feet in the air in the house all day long, never walk a step. What would you want with shoes? Whenever you put shoes on your feet, that means you're going to do some walking. And when God saves you, God puts shoes on your feet, and God wants you to do some walking for him. That's why he put them on there, not to sit around and look at them and shine them, but to wear them uh, for his glory. And so he put shoes on his feet, and, and uh, the Bible says in Mark chapter 6, verse 9, Be shod with sandals. Get ready to move around. Do some business. Got a ring on your finger? Use your hands. 
They belong to God. You got the ring on there. Those hands now are sealed. Use them for God. Use your, your feet. And then notice finally the fatted calf was killed and eaten. Verse 23. After all this was done, the father received him back. The father put the robe on him, the shoes on him, the ring on him. And the father said, boy, I want you, boys, I want you to go. And don't you get that old poor John out there. I want you to go and get the fattest, most tender, best fed calf in the stall. And said, when you get that calf, I want you to kill that calf. You dress that calf. I want you to cook some of the best steak that you ever put on the grill. I, I want it fixed right. This boy, my son, is lost, and I just come home. And when you get that fatty calf cooked, we're going to eat. And after that, I want the musicians to come in. I want them to play some of the prettiest music you ever heard. And I want you children, along with my son, I want you, you to serve us. I want you to get up and dance for joy because my boys come home. I want you to be happy. I want you to make merry. I want you to show my boy that you're glad he's back home. He was dead, now he's alive. And he had communion at the table of the Father. The fruit of communion is joy, and the Father finds the lights in his children. And he said, I want him at my table. I want him fed. I want to have fellowship with him. He's mine. He sits at my table like Mephibosheth put his feet on the David's table. He's right here by my side. That's exactly what God does for that sinner when he saves him, and that's why you are and right today, you're sitting now, your feet under God's table, eating the bread, the steak, and what I'm feeding you from this Bible. You're fellowshipping. You're eating at God's table. You belong to God. You're God's child. And you ought to thank God that you are. You have listened well. Stand to your feet, will you please? Go and ask Debbie to come. And as she plays on the instrument, we're going to have a word of prayer. We're going to give an invitation. And I want you to obey the Lord. Bow your heads for prayer, will you please? Dear Father in heaven, use the message. Speak to many people in the radio listening audience. Speak to people here in this auditorium. Use the word of God. And our Father, we'll thank you for what you do. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. Debbie's going to play. Now you listen to me now. As Debbie plays. If you're in this building and you're unsaved and you want to get saved, you come right down here. If you're backslidden on God, you want to come back to God, you come down here. If you want to.